Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us all this afternoon for this panel on the social impact of 2020. We have an incredible rock star panel of speakers today spanning industry, academia, journalism, entrepreneurship, who are going to tell you their stories of how they have survived and thrived during this tumultuous time in our nation's history. Years from now, there will be many stories told about 2020. There will be those that recount with excruciating detail how a tiny virus brought the world to a standstill and astoundingly kicked the wealthiest nation's government to its knees. There will be those that share how our country's long and sordid history of racial inequality reared its head again when a white police officer pressed his knee into the neck of an innocent black citizen who gasped, I can't breathe. And there will be those too that tell when black and brown communities already suffering decades of federal divestment in turn bore disproportionately the carnage and economic insecurity of COVID-19. But there will also be stories like this one where living here today of ordinary citizens who came together to build each other up, to share resilience, and to pluck beauty from the gloom. There will be the stories of communities across the country who paying homage to the knitting groups of World War II responded to the PPE shortages by handcrafting their own masks. There inevitably will be the tale of Americans who were distraught by centuries of racism, who finally came together in the largest, largest protests this country has yet seen against its original sin. And of course, there will be the stories of ordinary Americans who volunteered to staff food banks and homeless shelters and polling booths across this country. These are the stories, the heroes who responded to this crisis with resilience and with grit that epitomize the American spirit and that we will seek to highlight today with our incredible three speakers. I want to introduce each of them now to you. We have Byron Sanders, Donna Harris, and Obed Manuel, all of whom you should see pictured here on the screen. Byron Sanders is the president and CEO of Big Thought, a youth development organization closing the opportunity gap for kids in marginalized communities with the skills and the tools that they need to imagine and to create their best lives and a better world. Donna Harris is a serial entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, and founder and CEO of Builders and Backers, an organization created to ignite action in communities across the world with experimentation and entrepreneurial action. She also worked with Dallas-based tech startup VOMO on a nationwide campaign called Be a Voter to connect national nonprofits to volunteers during this time of humanitarian crisis. And Obed Manuel is a staff writer at Dallas Morning News, who's covering immigration, local news, politics, social justice, and the issues affecting second generation immigrants in North Texas. Since March, he stood on the front lines of both the COVID-19 crisis and the Black Lives Matter protests, bringing vital coverage on both of these issues to the state of Texas. And my name is Dr. Sajal Hathi. I'm a primary care doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital and the host of the Civic Rx podcast, which seeks to inspire and galvanize conversation about how we can build a more just and healthier world. We're going to embark on this conversation today with a question for each of our panelists. And Obed, I'll let you go ahead and, and start with, with this one. And the first question is, what was your hope for 2020 one year ago today, before the word pandemic and the name George Floyd? How did you envision this year unfolding? Well, first of all, it's, a, it's, it's an honor to be here among such a great company. Um, that's, a, that's a tough question. Uh, as a journalist, um, you know, we sort of roll with the punches. Um, if you had told me that a pandemic was going to break out, I wouldn't have believed you because obviously we haven't seen something like this. 
um, obviously since the start of the last century. Um, you know, there's, there's personally, I was hoping, right, for more uh, career opportunity, right, where I work, uh, which I fortunately did get. Um, but, you know, socially, obviously, we always want to see progress. We want to see, you know, particularly among the the reporting that I do, which, you know, I've always tried to focus on, you know, underserved communities and communities that, you know, deserve to, I don't want to say have their stories told, but deserve to be heard. I think that's that's the better way to say it. Um, I think I, I would have liked to see that uh, not be muddled, right, by a uh, virus that has changed pretty much every facet of our of our lives. Um, on the other hand, um, tragedy has sparked a conversation that it's not to say that it's long overdue feels like an understatement. It feels like the wrong thing to say, but it is long overdue. Um, the conversation about racial justice because it affects you know every person of color in this country, uh, some worse than others. Um, so I don't know, this is a very mixed bag of a year, uh, but as far as like what I was hoping for, I was hoping that people would be heard. And I mean, this is why we're here, right? People people are being heard right now um, and we can only hope that it'll bring some change. Absolutely. Donna, what do you think? I'll mute myself. <laughs> it, it has definitely been, um, I feel like, the question of what was I hoping for a year ago, I feel like I was reaching back decades to imagine how I was feeling even just a year ago. It's been such a complicated um, emotional roller coaster of a year. Um, you know, this is a tough question for me. Coming off of three years of research into why some communities were thriving and others were falling behind, um, I kind of went down a three year rabbit hole to sort of get to the roots of all of that. And what I found was a lot of the sort of the depth of the brokenness is deeper than we think. The roots go a lot deeper and they're rooted a lot stronger than we realize. And the the sort of tears in the fabric that we're seeing the symptoms of, um, you know, these things are are a lot deeper. So I I had a sense coming into 2020 because I was had, had finished this research um, that we were deeply broken. And so I wasn't actually coming into 2020 feeling super optimistic about, you know, the sort of work ahead of me. I was optimistic about getting down to work, working with entrepreneurs to help them understand those roots and to start solving it. And I was looking forward to getting into every community across the country, like I did with Startup America, where I literally spent a year and a half on the road visiting great people. And it's how I got to meet so many lovely people in, in Dallas that obviously I'm, I'm in my kitchen right now, so that's not happening. Um, but you know, nobody could have predicted a pandemic, but um, I'm completely unsurprised at how the pandemic is highlighting what it's hitting. I'm unsurprised that racial tensions are boiling over. I'm unsurprised that we're in a moment of bitter partisanship. Um, and I'm unsurprised that the pandemic is having outsized effects on some proportions of our population, some types of companies, some communities. Um, you know, the sort of vectors these things would go could be predicted based on really understanding the roots of why some of our communities are so broken. Yeah, however devastating it is, if you will, it's, it is, I agree with you, unsurprising. And, and I think that is what's been, in some sense, both more upsetting um, than I might have anticipated and, and also um, promising, if you will, because it, it has forced us to reckon with these questions that we had been shoving beneath our consciousness for decades. Um, it, it, Byron, what do you have to say? Um, you know, if I go back to my um, BC era, feels like you know, um, before Corona era, it's it's a it's a it's a really interesting world you, you think about what your priorities were you think about what you what your routine was when you woke up in the morning you think I, I i i miss taking my daughter to work school i miss taking my driving my daughter to school now i i step out the door and i can kiss her on top of the head now but that was a so you think about those things um <clears throat> what i was expecting to do uh prior to this was um 
continuing along and we were in growth mode. We were in expansion mode as an organization. We were going to new and different places and spaces. We were starting to spread our mission uh, and live our mission differently. And then March 13th, that was a place home uh, and began remote work. And I haven't seen or hugged, uh, you know, team members and, and, and people since then. And so it's a different world. I, I would say that <clears throat> I agree. It's wholly unsurprising that given presented with a pandemic that um, the, the folks who have suffered the most from it uh, have been the ones who have right? Black and brown communities, uh, those who are poor, those who are living on the margins already. Uh, one of the things that has been very surprising, I'll just be real honest with you, is the degree to which a lot of the things, so so it, it there's two sides of the coin. You know, we had a rash of uh, statements released with Black Lives Matter plastered all on the front, in the middle, throughout. We were talking about white supremacy, not for white supremacists, but actual as systems and structures. Like these things were starting to enter the public narrative. And I got to be honest with you, it's um, it was refreshing because people of color in, in a small have been talking about this for a very, very, very long time, right? <clears throat> But it was it, it felt like it was being received with new ears, new eyes. And I asked, I flat out social media, I, I asked the question. I was like, I said, white people, what's different now? What happened? Um, because the way George Floyd died was horrific. Eric Garner died in a very similar fashion. 14, literally saying the exact same words. I can't breathe. What What now? And it's this confluence of the pandemic, um, our national leadership and discourse, way he died, and how clearly it was presented that there is a racial uh, racism issue here. And the fact that people weren't allowed to go to soccer later on that night, they weren't allowed to go to work the next morning, they weren't allowed to, to distract themselves with all the things that we get distracted by. We had to stare it in the face and indeed we were actually looking at ourselves. And so in that moment, a lot of things did change. The question is, what are we gonna do with that? What are we gonna do with this new awareness? And I think that story is still being written. And Byron, on that note, I do want to ask you about what Big Thought is doing to respond to this moment of reckoning and to redress these inequalities that the pandemic and the protests have um, exposed, rightly so. But before we do, I perhaps did not do full justice to the incredible work that you've been doing for years with your organization. And so I want to ask you, what is the focus and the mission, in your own words, of Big Thought, and how has that evolved or otherwise been informed by the string of crises from the pandemic mm -hmm. to the protests to most recently the school closings and um, haphazard reopenings we're seeing across this country um, over the last few months? Yeah, yeah. All in a day's work, right? You know, I, I would say we're on version 12.0 since March <laughs> of ourselves. But what Big Thought is, we're an organization um, that works with young people across a range of different programs and systems that we intermediate. Um, and the whole point is to build the creative muscle, social, emotional well being, and help young people discover and leverage their own voice, youth agency. And the two at end is uh, the 21st century is a, it's a century unlike any we've ever seen before. Automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these things are completely redefining what it means to be a person in the workforce. And uh, Gallup, World Economic Forum, uh, Future Jobs Report. There are, you know, LinkedIn, 
they're all saying the same things, that the skills we need from young people today are less hard technical skills because a lot of these rapidly or they're being completely automated out. The things that we need from young people and adults to function, critical thinking, create problem solving, emotional intelligence and agility. Um, that's what our work does. A range of different ways of arts creating STEM, but it's uh, almost always in a non-traditional learning space. So it's uh, out of school time, summer learning, things of that nature. And we focus using the uh, in access to those high quality experiences with uh, black and brown youth uh, of color, usually uh, in low income areas. That's our target market, not our exclusive service line, but uh, those are the folks that we're trying to serve. So the way that that changed for us here was um, when we went to shelter in place, a lot of our programs are delivered on campus in a school. And so uh, when we closed the schools, that wasn't possible anymore. Yet we still had these kids. Uh, we still had these families that were lying and they they had to adjust to a brand new world where they everybody had to go to remote learning and uh, you know it's another conversation i don't know if we have time for it to talk about why we ended up exactly in the same place that we were in in march again in september uh but but here we are um bottom line is though a lot of young people still needed us to be there. They still needed these creative learning experiences. Uh, they still needed us to be able to connect with them and help provide social supports. So we uh, took a lot of what we were doing in person and we went virtual or we went hybrid. Um, um, we took our programs and uh, things that we were planning to do three years from now, we did in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, we uh, a transition just about every kind of program that we had to an in-person uh, synchronous learn uh, for the ones that required direct contact we tried to and we uh, uh, launched programs uh, or iterations of those programs where kids would be able to get uh, or a, um, a teaching artist uh, live for a lot of other families though we um, uh, our programs that program providers that we support, that they had a platform for people to go and access their work um, um, online as well. It's called Dallas City of Learning. And so we usually you're going to that site to look for in-person experiences. We flipped it and made it a, um, it's called Dallas City of Learning Digital Exp. Their content was available uh, virtually. Um, we did a hybrid um, program uh, because of the digital divide. Digital divide has always been there. We talk about it. People have talked about it, but it's become a big topic because coronavirus did what coronavirus does and every other inequity and system systemic failure that we've had existing for a long time. It just shined a glaring hot spotlight on it uh, and it showed that this is something that we need to address creatively and quickly if we want to be an equitable society. So we created a hot system where we would actually send kits of materials out to young people that we were already serving. And we combined that with being able to, if you needed to go online, but you also had materials that you could do in hands, um, making sure that they were developmentally appropriate. And it was these, a beautiful set of experiences. One of them, my kids got, they opened it up and we, doing and then uh, we realized that it's a planting seeds you actually would plant seeds and nurture it and there was a science experiment so we had to make sure that we were reaching people yes in spite of the digital divide and also leveraging um, uh, digital connectivity in order to make sure that we're continuing to, to be there for our families amazing um, congratulations and thank you for all that you're doing in and all that you've done to so swiftly adapt to, I think, this changing learning context. Another question for you on that front, and is, has your curriculum evolved in any way to incorporate a greater call to civic engagement, democracy building, advocacy on behalf of these causes and communities that have been disproportionately afflicted. Um, what responsibility do you see organizations like yours and specifically Big Thought 
playing mm -hmm. in educating and activating the next generation to respond yes. to crises like this. Well, the interesting thing is anybody who's in youth de de development spaces right now, especially if you're working with teens, if you're not addressing the things that you just talked about, you're actually behind because they're coming with questions. They're coming with fire. They're coming with anger, quite frankly. Um, and if you don't have, if you, if you're not even mentally prepared to, to take that. And if you try to squelch that voice, you're going to have problems. They're going to leave or you're going to get your stuff upended. So fortunately we were in a place where that actually is kind of our MO. We have a program called Artivism, which is art as activism. Uh, there's some beautiful content that some of our young people are putting up uh, right now. We actually just posted a, a preview today on our social media, on, on our um, uh, Facebook page of a, um, uh, there's a, a digital work to young lady spoken word that's overlaid on top of it. And um, the reason why we felt it was really important to incorporate these themes is because this is the lived experience for every young person in this country right now. They're watching. Their eyes are open, their ears are open, and they have a lot of energy. You see what's going on out here in the streets. These are young people. These are the young people marching and walking. And you know what? Thank God for them. Nothing has ever shifted in American society. If you go back and look at our nothing has ever shifted in American society without young people's voice centered and prominently featured. Civil rights movement, even the American Revolution, those weren't old, old doing a lot of that work. These were young people. And so the same thing is happening right now. And our programs create a space for that. Creative Solutions, a program that deals with, uh, serves young people in the juvenile justice system who are actually on probation. They have a lot to talk about the systems that actually put them there and they have space to do it. And so we're creating that platform, sharing space and making sure that young people have the uh, tools that they need in order to tell those stories and move people to action. Uh, I think it's required. And if you're going to be an anti-racist organization, you better be doing it. Otherwise, you're just being non-racist. And quite frankly, that's status quo. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much, Byron. Dallas, I, 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 Dallas is um, really grateful to have organizations like your own. So thank you. I, I, I wish that I could have benefited from something like that when I was younger. I want to move on um, to Donna Harris. Uh, Donna, you have been connecting entrepreneurs to funding and resources across the globe for decades now, since 1997, when you started your very first company in Detroit. Um, and in, in the last decade, you worked on the Startup America Partnership, you worked on the Global Entrepreneurship Network, and you funded the Startup Tech Incubator 1776 in Washington, D.C. I want to ask you, how has your history, your decades long of coalition building and, and network creating prepared you for, for this year? Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating how we all think that we can just engineer our plan for our careers and our lives and somehow go execute that. And the reality is life often has its own plan for us. Um, so had you asked me when I began my career, if this is where I would end up, I would have said, absolutely not. I actually began my entire career as a mistake. Um, but I find myself in this moment where I feel immensely prepared to meet this moment in a way that I wouldn't have been if I hadn't had those up, those experiences, right? So Startup America was literally about mobilizing entrepreneurs all over the country in response to the last recession, right? We were coming out of the housing crisis, the great recession. Kaufman had just published the research around entrepreneurship, high growth companies, jobs, job creation. And my task was to go mobilize entrepreneurial leaders and communities all over the country, including people in Dallas and across Texas. Um, to in essence take responsibility for our own communities, figure out what our entrepreneurs need and go put them in place. And it was not top down, it wasn't institutionally led. Um, it was led by, by people like us, entrepreneurs who can just get up every day and go, okay, what is the thing I wish I had in my community that I didn't have? Like, kind of like you just said, I wish I'd had that. Um, we 
step up and say, okay, let's go experiment that with that, but let's do it in a way where we share what we learned so that if we stumble on something that works in Dallas, let's not hoard it. Let's share it so that it can also work in Columbus and Cleveland and Winston-Salem and everywhere else across the country. And, and now we find ourselves in this moment where we have a pandemic, we have an economic crisis, we have social unrest, we have political unrest, and we have enormous partisanship. And the reality is entrepreneurs aren't just needed in this moment because we have to save the small businesses and we need to get the jobs that they're going to create. People who are entrepreneurial thinkers and doers need to be the leaders in this moment because of a lot of the partisan gridlock and a lot of what we're seeing in the newspaper every day, right? We're not going to mobilize the leadership in, that we need in this moment through both either institutional or top-down models. And the one thing I learned from my work at Start America is when you can aim entrepreneurs at a common vision, right? We all share this ideal about what we could do, what's possible if, if we aimed at it. And then we work in these sort of loose coalitions and networks, it's a pretty unstoppable group of people. And, you know, that's really what's needed in this moment. If you think about all that is broken in community, I mean, certainly we need institutional solutions. We need some changes at government levels. We need a, a, a lot of things, but there's actually a lot that we can do at the ground level. And there's a lot that we can do in individual communities that we can sort of treat them like petri dishes where we can run ideas and experiments. Let's roll up our sleeves and let's try some stuff and let's figure out what works and then let's share it. And that's in essence exactly what we did through the Startup America network that was built, right? It wasn't about my ideas. It was about everyone's ideas, but it was also this common ethos of we all care about our communities. We all want our communities to be better. We might have different hypotheses about how to fix a particular problem, that's okay. We can run two different sets of tests and we can figure out which one is right. They might both be right. They might, be, might both be good ideas and let's unleash all sorts of this across the country. And, and in essence, that's, that's a little bit of what's been forgotten. It, you know, we're, we're sort of in love with this idea of big institutions. We're in love with that, this idea that whoever sits in the White House is somehow gonna magically change everything. And that's a, a longer conversation for sure. But the reality is, as I've learned over three years, and I've really gone and looked at these problems very, very deeply, when we get down to the root level, there's actually a lot more that we can be doing to fix them if we all saw ourselves as the people who could step up. But we also have to, to train it, much like, like Byron said, like having an identity beyond being a consumer in America is not something many of us learned, right? And, and, and we're exercising these new muscles of civic responsibility by marching and organizing and protesting. Being a builder is a civic muscle, right? It, we have markets, we have, the, we have government, and we have civil society. We're civil society. And there's a whole lot of muscle beyond organizing and marching and voting that we also have to activate. And that's the part that we're focused on is how do, how do we teach people to figure out what's broken? How do we equip them with the tools that we teach entrepreneurs every day, but aiming them at any sort of problem that somebody might want to solve in their community and doing it in very accessible ways? Because we don't need complicated models. This is actually fairly simplistic stuff. How do you experiment? How do you unpack a problem? How do you get to the root? There's there's some fairly simple ways you can you can teach that. So, um, you know, that's what what we think is sort of needed in this moment. It's ironically exactly the kind of thing that we did in the wake of the Great Recession with Startup America and global entrepreneurship and sort of what I was advocating for at 1776 as well. I, agree. I think the greatest challenge and opportunity both for this country over the next decade will be ordinary people stepping up into their own power and recognizing and embracing their own agency to change the systems and the structures that have oppressed so many for so long. As our former president, Barack Obama, stated himself, you know, democracy is not a noun, it's a verb. And we each have a vital role to play into shaping this country in the place that we want it to be for ourselves as well as for our children. And I uh, appreciate and applaud you for doing your part um, 
for that purpose with the organizations that you've started and also with this new group that you that you launched uh, in the last couple of months, specifically um, with the Be a Neighbor campaign. Can you briefly tell us what that is and what the results have been of that campaign to date? Sure. So, um, you know, the research that I did in essence found what I call 10 spirals of distress. And, you know, Byron has said it well, they, they add up to a very deep system of brokenness. And so all of my investment capital over the last three years and my capital going forward is basically being directed at things that repair these fractures. One of them has to do with the root causes of the decline in community engagement and community commitment. And, you know, and sort of the corollary, the fact that we keep serving and solving in two completely separate spheres, as opposed to seeing them as two sides of the same coin. Um, and so one of the strategic investments that I made was in a Dallas-based company called Vomo. Um, and Vomo is a platform to mobilize volunteerism across the country, led, led by just a fantastic local team. And we've been working to, in essence, roll them out to every community in America as a way to sort of get people into the funnel, right? If, if, if you live in a community, volunteerism is, volunteerism is the top of the funnel. It's how you start getting engaged. Once you start volunteering, then we can start asking, why does that problem exist in the first place? And how do we begin to apply buildership tools to solve that problem? So we saw this is really um, related to what we were trying to do with builders and backers and solving the, the sort of systemic brokenness that is there. Um, the Be a Neighbor campaign actually launched last year um, when the Mr. Rogers film came out. It's a partnership with Sony Pictures and it was designed to, in essence, mobilize a day of volunteerism um, in, in sort of the, um, the aura of Mr. Rogers and caring for our communities. And it was a highly successful day. And then as the pandemic was hitting, uh, Rob Peabody, who's the CEO of Omo, he and I were um, wringing our hands on the phone, multiple phone calls during uh, the second week of March, sort of, what can we do? And we sort of had this giant aha that we we're sitting on this massive, a massive platform that literally could be used by frontline organizations to mobilize volunteers. And the only impediment was that we were asking them to pay for it. Uh, we're asking not for profits to pay for it. So we decided to put together a coalition and remove that barrier. So um, for the months, sort of March, April, May into early June, we gave away the platform for free. Any non-for-profit anywhere in the United States that was doing frontline, uh, mobilizing to meet frontline needs, whether it was healthcare, food banks, blood banks, you name it, anybody could use it for free. And then we had an entire team of people that were helping mobilize volunteers as well. And to put out a widget that uh, any newspaper in America could use for free to put volunteer opportunities in front of their readers. Um, anytime there was an article about COVID or the need for volunteers, they would see this widget that would pop up that would tell them how they could take action. And through that, we had um, over 11 million people mobilized to see and respond to volunteer opportunities, which sounds like a lot. Uh, but it's actually a tiny little drop in the bucket for what's needed because on an average year, U.S. volunteer, U.S. not-for-profits count on over 60 million volunteers to deliver the work that they need. And now more than ever, we have that need. And so it's been both phenomenally successful. We're pleased that we had this asset that we could make available. But, you know, the work is just beginning because this sense that, it, you know, who should take care of our community, we have gotten to a place oftentimes where the answer isn't me. The answer is somebody, an institution, the government, the mayor, the whomever. Um, in fact, when I did my research, it was the very first question I asked, tell me about something that's broken in your community. Hmm. And the answer was almost always phrased, somebody should do something about fill in the blank. Well, who is the somebody? <laughs> the somebody is me. Um, and so we've really got to do a lot of work to think about the culture. Um, and this is why the sort of spirals of distress has become something that we talk a lot about as builders and backers, because the more we understand the system, the more we understand our part in fixing the system. And volunteerism is one, one tiny piece of that. 
Thank you. Well, you know, one of the crucial purveyors of information about the system, um, the voice, the voice that helps us really articulate and understand this culture and change that culture as well is what many call the fourth estate, that is the media. And so I want to move on to Obed and, and the critical work that you've done over the last few years to cover a range of topics from ICE raids and immigration policy to disparities in health care to homelessness in Dallas. You've covered so many crises, and yet this year has in many ways felt different. How have you gotten your head around these issues like COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter? And how did you strive to take emotion and perhaps personal bias too out of your reporting? Um, you know, I've been I've been um, playing with that idea for a while now. I mean, I as a immigrant person of color, um, I always tell people, and some people are, if, if there's anybody on listening who has uh, heard me say this before, they're probably tired of hearing me say it, but, you know, at the end of the day, I can't take my skin off. I can't take my immigrant experience off. When I write a story about an immigrant family, I'm writing about my own family. I'm writing about my friends that I grew up with in Oak Cliff. Um, it's it's I can't take emotion out of the work that I do, because so much of the stories that I have done are about the impact of the institutional impact on on the human on human lives. It's the human value that my stories try to, you know, uh, explore. And and it's like who is suffering here? Who needs the help? Um, it, it's 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 as far as like wrapping my head around these things. I mean, this is. This pan I mean, pandemic is not something anyone has seen before. Um, you know, we've had previous scares with these types of things, but like they, they haven't gotten to this level. Like you said at the beginning, like they've brought us as a nation to our knees. Um, they've brought us as a community to our knees. Um, so it, it's it's hard to say whether or not I fully understand what this looks like because every community is different. Um, our community, in particular, uh, is one that we know uh, has had historic uh, issues of mistreatment of people of color. Um, you know, originally it was black people and the indigenous populations that were here. Now it's come to be, it, it remains those populations. And now it's a population, very immigrant population that has inherited a lot of those problems. Um, so it's, 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 it's really difficult to say, um, you know, how these issues are going to play out and what it's going to look like but the truth is that like we keep doing this work i keep doing this work my colleagues at the paper and other local you know news organizations do this work because there's you know i report a lot i've reported a lot on sort of like uninsured populations and how here in texas we have a serious issue with that um poverty the amount of people living in poverty in dallas there's the, those are statistics but behind those statistics are people are people who ride the bus, who go to the food banks, who now are relying on the food banks more than ever. Um, it's 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 the human value. I I know that that sounds it's, it sounds repetitive, but like that's that's what we're dealing with right now is the human value of COVID, and we've known for a long time that the you know mistreatment of Black people um, by institutions. Um, and specifically here, right, what's kickstarted that, that that conversation is unfortunately the death of a person at the hands of police. Um, Byron made a really good point uh, earlier about sort of like the young people. Uh, I was covering a protest in Richardson uh, back in June, and there was a few people there who who said that this was their first protest ever uh, attending. And I asked them, you know, what was different this time? And it was a mom who said, my daughter, who was about eight or nine, she said, saw the video of George Floyd, you know, being kneeled, being knelt on, uh, on TikTok. And she saw it and she brought the phone over to her mom and said, what is this? What, what is, what's happening? And she just, I, I think for her, maybe it was like, she couldn't, she maybe was a little bit insulted that her daughter, you know, had come across this somehow. 
But she then went further to recognize the fact that I need to do something about this. I need to support my daughter in her search for truth. And to a degree, it was her own search for truth. And so I think a lot, for, for us as journalists, it's, it's, it's ne I don't know if we ever fully wrap our heads around the stories that we do because they evolve and they're always changing and they're constantly going. Sometimes the situations that we report on improve. Sadly, most of the times they don't. Um, but at the end of the day, like it's our job to try and bring truth. And right now we're sort of struggling with that. The thing I think that we're really struggling with is do we go beyond that? Is, 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 is reporting truth enough right now? Is that, um, does truth involve, uh, I, I know for me personally, you know, truth involves calling out racism and calling it what it is. But institutionally, sometimes it doesn't, you know, uh, for, for a lot of news publications, it, it doesn't include that. It includes, it includes explaining it. It doesn't include sort of doing something about it. So it's, it's, it's an interesting time, I would say, to be a journalist, to, to be somebody who, you know, wants to listen to the community. Um, but, you know, there are times, especially right now, when the community is so angry that, you know, you sort of question your role. Uh, what, what should I be doing? What should, should I be more active here? Should I be asking, what are the questions that I should be asking? Um, have I been asking the right questions all along? Um, you know, we're, we're in this state right now where, where we're questioning the very foundation of what we do as a, I'm not going to say industry, I'm going to say as a practice, uh, as a practice, as a, you know, we have a responsibility is what I'll say. And, you know, we're all sort of juggling that question is what should we be doing right now? Um, beyond the stories that we report, we are taking a very deep personal look at how we function. Um, and we don't have that answer yet. So uh, it's it's a lot. There's a lot of moving pieces right now in the industry. Um, but, you know, with these, these types of conversations and then with listening to the community, uh, the communities that we serve, because ultimately, I've said this to other people is, without the communities and their trust, like we're powerless. Without them calling me or texting me, which I, I'm fortunate they do, without that trust, like we are powerless. We don't have that access to the families that are suffering unemployment and COVID. We don't have access to the organizers, you know, putting together the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and, you know, some of us in the industry are fortunate to have that, but, you know, I would like to see the industry as a whole have that. And, and I mean, we, we have a lot of work to do. I agree with you. And I'm conscious that we're imminently to end. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for joining us today and, and to our excellent panelists for sharing your stories. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being part of this conversation. Thank you.